We're just getting, just getting warmed up tonight. Uh, what reveals power in this world? And when you think of power, what comes to your mind? One of the things that comes to my mind is big waves. Uh, I grew up in Huntington Beach. I grew up uh, surfing when I was younger. When I turned about 13, 14 years old, I switched over to something called body surfing, and I, where you give up the board, and it's a whole different experience. And I started body surfing a place called The Wedge. Uh, the wave you're seeing up on the screen here uh, is, uh, let's see, there we go. That's a big wave. Uh, if you're just swimming around on a casual Sunday afternoon, uh, and that hits you, you're in trouble. Well, where I grew up body surfing at The Wedge, it's a shore break, which means even if you get a really good wave... You normally don't get out of the wave, and then the wave is what happens, that the term for it is you get ragdolled. Do you know what it means to get ragdolled on a wave? It means you go like this, all over the place, and you flip all over, and you're pounded against the sand, and you go, why would you do that? I'm not sure, but I've done it for years, and I still, when the waves are good and I can get down there with my little brother, I love to body surf at the wedge. Well, I got a picture from my little brother, Jason. He turned 50 years old, happened to be good waves on, at the wedge on his 50th birthday, and he sent me this picture. A friend of his was out there taking pictures. That's my little brother, Jason. Um, he's in a, not a massive wave, but it's a thick wave. And I will tell you, just by looking at how it's breaking, he's not going to get out of that, go around, and kind of swim back out. He's going to get ragdolled. It's going to close down on him, and he's going to go with all over the sand, and he loved it. He sent me a couple of pictures, and he said, he said, this is me at 50. And I thought that was kind of a nice, kind of a nice look. But, but if you, it, the ocean, even before I was a Christian, when I would sit at Huntington Beach and watch the waves come in, I didn't know there was a God. But I felt something. You know what I'm talking about? The, pow the power of that. And so, there, so, so what, you know, what reveals power in our world? How about muscles? You see somebody who's, who's I was going to flex for you, but I just decided to take a picture. Um, <laughs> But, you know, you, know, you go, mm, power, right? And you go, oh, that, that's power. What shows power in our world? How about this? This is a Carolina Reaper pepper. On the Scoville scale, it's, uh, the technical term is it's a bit spicy. It's a bit spicy. If you cook, if you use a, a Carolina Reaper, you're going to, and don't tell your friends, they won't be your friends for much longer because it will just burn their mouths and it's hot, hot, hot. Power. But I want to suggest to you that the biggest, most powerful wave, the most in-shape person, no matter how powerful they might seem, you know, the most skilled warrior, the most, the most, the most you know, person with the greatest physical strength, uh, the, the spiciest food, none of those compare to the one who made everything, to the God whose name is El Shaddai. And by the way, if you're a little bit older, you need to know that the term El Shaddai was not made up by Amy Grant. Uh, who wrote a very popular song that was sung in every church, like sometimes twice in a service, uh, for about 10 years. Uh, but, but that term El Shaddai is the Hebrew name for God, the Almighty One. And we're going to look at two passages. If we have enough time, we'll look at three, uh, where, where, where this name first comes up. And it's at the very beginning of the Bible. So if you have a Bible, turn to the book of Genesis. And God is God eternally. So if we think about God as the Almighty One, He's the Almighty One from the beginning. So as He's establishing a nation, as He's forming a people in the book of Genesis, through whom the Messiah will come, through whom the King of Kings and Lord of Lords will come, through this nation, He calls Abraham to follow Him. And when He calls Abraham, He gives His name to Abraham. Look at Genesis chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. And I want you to notice in God's word, and again, I'm not just here to open the word and read it to you and teach it to you. I want the spirit of God to speak to your heart. So as you listen to this word from the Lord, as you look on the screens or if you follow in your Bibles, your Bible app, whatever you're using, I want you to try to notice not only who God is as the Almighty One, but what difference that makes. What happens when we live alongside of the one who is El Shaddai, who is God Almighty? Genesis 17, beginning in verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old. The Lord appeared to him and said, and here's the words, I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty, the Almighty God. So walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Why? Because I am El Shaddai. So you should live like this. Verse two. Then I will make my covenant between me and you, and will greatly increase your numbers. Two things. God says, I'm going to make a covenant, an agreement, a binding agreement that will last forever and ever for all generations, and I'll increase your numbers. This is kids, grandkids, a family, a legacy. Verse 3. 
Abraham fell face down. A good response when you see God Almighty. And God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant. This is my, my binding agreement with you. You will be the father of many nations. Now you have to understand at this point, Abraham didn't have any offspring. But God, who is almighty, said, you'll be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abraham, but your name will be Abraham. You won't just be exalted father, you'll be the father of many. God says, I'm going to change your name, I'm going to change your destiny, I'm going to change your character, I'm going to change everything about you. That's what God Almighty can do. Amen? He can change everything. He can take an atheistic surf punk and call him to be a pastor. Only God Almighty. He can take who you were and make you who you're becoming because he's God Almighty. No longer will you be called Abraham. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. Multiplication. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. Abraham couldn't even imagine an offspring at that point, much less uh, offspring and nations and royalty. But God says, that's what I, God Almighty, can do. And then he says this, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations even after them, the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. I'll be the God of generations. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, you don't belong. It's not your land. You're a foreigner. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you. And I will be their God. Oh, God El Shaddai, mighty God. In this world that is so broken and so confused, in this world where, where we can feel discouraged and disheartened and empty and poured out, will you reveal yourself as God Almighty? Lord, I pray for the people right now who are gathered here in the worship center, who are outdoors in the courtyard, and for those who are at home. I pray for those people who feel depleted and empty and just turning on their TV or their computer or, or finding the Shoreline app on their phone, just showing up here tonight was, was sort of the, the last ounce of strength they had. They feel beat up and discouraged and disheartened, and, and, and they've kind of drugged themselves one more time into your presence to say, oh Lord, can you fill me? Oh Lord, can you carry me through one more night and one more day? I pray, oh God, that like a crashing wave, you will descend upon their hearts and their lives, and they will see that you are the almighty God, and that where they are weak, God, you are strong. Where they are empty, you are fully capable of filling them up. I pray, El Shaddai, God Almighty, that we will see you in your glory and your power and we will so bind our lives to you that your power will become our strength and your hope will fill our hearts and the destiny you have spoken for us we will begin to not only recognize but hope for and dream for and have confidence in. God, speak to us through Abraham. Speak to us through Jacob. Speak to us by your spirit, we pray, for your glory. And everyone said, amen. amen. That's not the end of the sermon. Somebody thought, well, you prayed, it's over. No, we're just starting, okay? Um, and I'm gonna check with the team. I'm supposed to have 20 minutes to preach, but I still have 20 and a half minutes. Is that accurate? Yes. Praise the Lord. God's given me extra time. We might get to Moses, too. We might get to Moses. Uh, but we're, okay. So, so Abraham has this encounter with God. Abraham is a foreigner. He, 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 is a, he is wandering, and God shows up. Abraham feels empty and weak. Abraham has been longing for a family, longing for a legacy, and it hasn't been coming, and it hasn't been coming, and it hasn't been coming. And God comes to him, and God speaks to him. And he says, I am El Shaddai. And I love this. So God says to him in Genesis 17, 1, because I am El Shaddai, listen to this, you be faithful and blameless. Do you understand? And that one of the reasons we're going through all these names for God this year 
is that when we know who our God is, and we know that that God dwells in us by his spirit, God defines who we are. That's why I said a week or two ago in a sermon, it so frustrates me when people say, when people who are Christians, who've grown up around the word of God and who've heard the scriptures preached and taught, people say, oh, I gotta go discover myself. I gotta go find myself. I say, no, 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 no. Find Jesus. Find God Almighty. And you'll know who you are. I didn't know who I was till I met Jesus. And he told me who I was. I was a beloved child. I was worthy of his own life being laid down. I didn't feel that way. Nothing in me felt worthy of the sacrifice of Jesus, but he said, I gave myself for you. And all of a sudden I realized, oh, that's who I am. And here's the beauty of knowing who you are based on who God is. It doesn't change. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? He doesn't change, so you don't change. I got a great job. I got good, good income. I'm somebody. I lost my job. I don't have the income. I'm nobody. Wrong. Wrong. If you're a, if you're a child of the living God, if you hear his voice speak to you, he says, this is who you are. Whether you got this much money or this much money. Whether you feel physically strong or you're in the middle of a health crisis. He's, God says, I haven't changed, so you haven't changed. And so God, God says to him, because I am El Shaddai, you now know who you are. You be faithful. You be blameless. Follow me. Walk with me. Seek me. And we're going to discover, as we come to the end of this, this, this study of El Shaddai, we're going to discover that when we are bound to the one who is almighty, we draw from his strength. And if we walk disconnected, we walk in our strength. And guess what? Our strength always falls short. Always. Now, on my best day, on my best day, I'm not strong enough to handle what this world throws my way. But on my worst day, I can stand in the power of God. You follow that? Yeah. On our best day, we can't make it through what this world's going to throw our way. But in our weakest moments, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Why? Because of his power. So find your identity in him and follow him. Be faithful to him. Walk blameless. Walk in holiness. Let him change you, transform you. But even in the weakness, even along the way, if you stay bound to him, you walk and live in his strength. And then in verse 2 of Genesis 17, because he is El Shaddai, he says, I'm a God of covenant. We don't talk about covenant much these days. At Shoreline we do because if you're going to get married at Shoreline, we don't talk about wedding services at Shoreline or wedding parties or whatever they, are, they become these days. We talk about a, covenant, a celebration of the covenant of Christian marriage. That's the term we use here. It's covenantal. It's an agreement. I will live this way in fellowship with you as you live this way. And God takes a man and a woman and he makes the two one and they, and, and, and they are bound together in the power of God Almighty. Well, God Almighty says, I'm a covenant-making God. I make a covenant with you. Do you understand that, that when you came to faith in Jesus, if you haven't yet, I hope you do very, very soon, but when you put your faith in Jesus, God says, I establish a covenant with you. Through Jesus Christ, he says, your sins are washed away, not because you're good, but because he's good. Through Jesus Christ and faith in him, the spirit of God moves in you and will never leave you and he'll never forsake you. So God says to Abraham, Abraham, who he gives a new name, Abraham, we'll talk about that in a moment. But God says to Abraham, he says, I will make a covenant with you. And we're not gonna get into the whole Abrahamic covenant tonight, but God makes this covenant, God makes this agreement and God says, hey, you know, here's my part. My part is I will provide, I will protect and God says, these are the things I will do. And now you, you be faithful, you be blameless, you follow me, you walk with me. So God actually comes to us and says, I want a relationship with you. So often we, so often we miss the, the, the covenantal reality of the intimacy of God Almighty. It's not just a vague, broad covenant with everyone who comes to him through faith in Jesus. God says, I make, an, I'll make a covenant with you. I make an agreement with you. I will be with you. I will be in you. I will lead you. I will empower you. He is a God of covenant. And then you continue on in verse two. Because he is El Shaddai, because he is God Almighty, he says, I will bless you. I am the God that part of what God's covenant with us is says, he says, I will be a God who blesses you. Now, don't shortchange God. You know what we often do with blessing? If we have plenty of money, we say, I'm blessed. And if we don't have enough money, we say, I guess I'm not blessed. If we reduce blessing to money, we, we are shortchanging ourselves in God. Now, when God says, I'll bless you, can he bless financially? Of course he can. Can he 
bless physically? Of course he can. Can he bless relationally? Absolutely. If you said, we, we've got a little grandson named Kel, and if you said to me, what would you trade for that little guy? How much money? What's it going to cost for me to buy that little grandson? After you, after you watched your son and his wife go through miscarriage and miscarriage and miscarriage and miscarriage and infertility, and God finally, in his grace, gave his child. Kevin, 100 bucks, 1,000 bucks, million bucks? Now that child's a blessing. What's the price tag? What's the, you tell me, what's the price tag? What's the answer? There's nothing, nothing that you can give me to give that child away. And also, my son and his wife would, would not allow me to. <laughs> but but you, you hear what I'm saying, right? Blessing. God says, I will bless you. What does that blessing look like? It looks like, it looks like a sunrise and a sunset. It looks like breathing another day. It looks like spending time with a friend over a, me, a good meal and talking and laughing and sharing life together. That's a blessing. You can't put a price on those things. And God says, I will bless you. I will bless you. And then he continues on. He says, I'm a God of covenant. I will bless you. How is he going to bless us? And he starts just, he kind of goes, here's some different things. Multiplication. I'm going to multiply. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you, make you, nations will come out of you. Multiplication. God in his blessing multiplies good things in our lives. God in his blessing for Abraham. Abraham gives him a new name. Abraham. Abraham means exalted father. Abraham means father of nations. Close, but different. And God says, I'm going to give you a new name. I, I one time saw a, a, a formal a cultural naming ceremony. You ever been to a naming ceremony? It happened on a soccer field with little kids that I was coaching in AYSO, American Youth Soccer Organization. I love soccer. I loved, I've, coached, I've coached probably 25 teams through the years. I love soccer. And so, so we got this, this team, and this new kid comes on the team. And, and I'd been coached for a couple of years, and this one kid named Keith, who was the goalie, and he was kind of in charge of the Keith, I put Keith as goalie, number one, because he was a good goalie, number two, because he was mouthy. He said, mark that man. Get that guy. Blah, you. And he'd tell the, tell the defense what to do. And on a kid's team, you need people that will talk to each other, right? So this new kid comes on the team. His mom pulls me aside, and she says, listen, my son has never played sports. She said he's kind of indoorsy. <laughs> and uh, she said he's kind of an indoorsy kid. And she said, you, you don't even have to play him. I just want him to be around the kids and experience. You know, I said, well, no, in AYSO, every kid gets to play the same amount of time. He'll be playing. But Keith, this young kid who was a goalie, performed a naming ceremony. Here's what he said. He said, hey, kid, come here. What's your name? And he said, he said Matthew. He says, Matthew. He says, we already got a mat. He says, how do you spell it? M-A-T-T. -T. Okay, T. He's, your name is double T. You're now Double T. He dubbed him Double T. And this kid, I don't think he'd ever had a nickname before. Another guy gave him a nickname. You're Double T. And this kid turned into a beast. I mean, he could, he, he, and Keith would say, mark that man. He'd be like, I'm on him, you know. But, but there was something about saying, okay, your, your, your parents gave you this name, Matthew, but I'm calling you Double T. And there was something, you, know, you, you following me? There was something about it to unleash something in him. Abraham, you're an exalted father, but here's your new name, father of nations. He didn't see it yet, but God promised it. Daughter of the living God, son of God Almighty, children of the king, priests, who can walk into the very presence of the living God because Jesus Christ has opened the way. Forgiven. We are our names. We're talking about God's names this year. We could spend a whole year every day on our names, who we are becoming because of what Jesus Christ has done. And so God says, I am almighty God, so I have the power. Whatever you've been named, I can give you a new name. Now, I, I'm still Kevin. I'm still what my parents named me. But when I came to faith in Jesus, I became a son of the living God. I became a royal priest. At 15 years old, I became a royal priest and had access to God Almighty. Why? Because that's what God says. Do you hear what he says about you? Do you understand who you are? And then, in verse 7, the generations to come will be impacted. That God says to, a, to Abraham, Abraham, who becomes Abraham, now from generation to generation, they will be my God. I, I, mean, I will be their God, and they will be my people. And God says, I will be with them. I will, I will be with you for generations to come. 
That's the promise of God. Why can he say that? Because he is God Almighty. In verse 7, he says, I will be your God. That's personal. Some of us here in this room, some of the people online, you think of God as, oh, well, there's God. He's out there somewhere. And he says, no, I am your God. I am your Savior. Take your faith personally. Why? Because God does. God takes your faith in him personally. When you said yes to Jesus, he said, you are my child. You are my beloved. You are forgiven. Believe it. We don't just believe in some vague God out there. We believe in the God who is alive, who is almighty, and who says, I'm in relationship with you. And then in verse 8, he says, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you a home. I'm going to give you a place to belong. In the ancient world, land was everything. You were a wanderer if you didn't have a place. And many, many people were Bedouin. Many people wandered from place to place. But God said to his people, I will give you a home. I will give you a place. Ultimately, that place is where, wherever God dwells. But we're going to see with Jacob, where Jacob declares this place, Bethel, the house of God, where he meets God, where, where, where Jacob, and we'll get to, we're going to get to Jacob. When, we, when, when Jacob meets God, he says, this place I met you is Bethel, the house of God. Why? Because I was dwelt with God here. I was with God in this place. And so you look at Abraham. And you hear a story, and so here's my question to you as we think about Abraham's experience of God as El Shaddai. Here's a question for us. How has El Shaddai blessed and poured out his goodness on you? And do you notice? God, who is almighty, says, I will bless you. Do you notice it? Or do we fixate on what we don't have and what we wish we had and the upgrade we long for? I want to upgrade this computer. I want to upgrade this car. I want to upgrade this relationship. We're, we're, we're consumed with upgrading and the next thing and the better thing and the bigger thing. But if you just stop and think of the people that God's put in your life, you think of the gifts that God has given to you. You think of that the, the, in the book of Ephesians we're told that if you come to faith in Jesus, you have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Do you recognize that God Almighty has blessed you. And we compare so much in our culture. We pull into a parking lot and we go, oh, look at that car and look what I'm driving. Or we look at somebody's physique and said, I wish I was, I wish I was given that at birth. I mean, I could be a superstar if I, but I got this, you know? I mean, we... we Oh, and, and Satan loves to keep us busy focusing on what we don't have and what we wish we had so we don't stop and say, oh God, you have been so good, you have blessed me. So here's your first encouragement tonight. Slow down and notice the blessings of God and celebrate them. Let's look at Jacob. Turn to Genesis 35. Because Jacob also encounters El Shaddai, God Almighty. Genesis 35, beginning in verse 11. And God said to him, I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. And he says to Jacob, and now remember, this is Abraham. Abraham is Isaac. Isaac is Jacob. So this is, this is Abraham's uh, grandson. He says to him, I am God Almighty, so you now be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply. A nation and a community of nations will come from you. This continued promise of multiplication. And kings will be among your descendants. Again, a promise of royalty. This is messianic. It's pointing to Jesus. It's pointing to the, the future ahead. That through, the, that through this nation will come the Savior, but also kings on this earth as well. Verse 12. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you. This is that promise to continue on through the generations. And I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at, that, at the place where he had talked with him. Jacob set up a stone pillar. This is sort of a memorial to remember. Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him. And he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. Jacob called the place where God had talked with him Bethel. Or Bethel, the house of God. He says, this is the dwelling place of God. Why? Because this is where I met him. This is where I talked with God. This is where I encountered the living God. So out of Jacob's journey, we see some things about when we walk with the one who is El Shaddai. We see, again, the promise of multiplication. I will make you uh, make nations of you. I will multiply. 
Now, now that, I don't think that's a promise that every single person who puts their faith in Jesus will have, you know, tons and tons of children. I don't think that's, that's the point. That's not the promise. The point is that God is a God that when he blesses, he multiplies and he multiplies and he multiplies. He brings up royalty again. That the, the lineage of, of his people will bring kings on this earth and ultimately the king of heaven into this world. He promises land, a home, a place. A place to be near God. A place where there's safety and security. But what I want to linger on here is that he invites us close. That God invites us to his house. You know, when you get to that point in a relationship where somebody says, oh, you got to come over to our place. There's a point. Yeah, you, know, you meet somebody and you, oh, yeah, they're, they're nice. They're, they're friendly. But they're not at that, do you want to come to my house place in the relationship? From a human standpoint. And there's, there's some people um, that, that aren't the come by my house for whatever reason kind of people, but there's people that at a certain point along the way, they recognize that the relationship has gone to a deeper level. And in, in a very real sense, what God says to Jacob, he says to Jacob, come on over. Come near. Hang out. Be close to me. Do you know how a lot of us perceive God? Naughty, naughty you. And we're, what we're doing, and as some of you were raised in a church context with lots of penance, whether, whether it was, okay, I kind of messed up, I came to faith, I put my faith in Jesus, I love him, I believe in him, but I kind of messed up, so for the next probably two or three or four weeks, I have to kind of, kind of skulk around with my tail between my legs because I was naughty and God doesn't love me. And eventually, if I do enough good things and behave good enough, then maybe God will invite me back into his presence. If I can earn my way. I mean, I don't, you don't have to raise your hand, but you know what I'm talking about? Some of you grew up with this. Okay, say this 50 times. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Anybody remember, anybody be able to, to give, to, to do the Hail Mary? Anybody got that ingrained in there? And I'm not, I'm not picking on church traditions, but I'm just saying, it's like, well, okay, say so many of these things, do so many of these things. Um, I think when I was, as a young Christian, the church culture I was in, when you messed up, there was kind of like, kind of like a penalty box. And for like a week or two, when I would mess up and do something, something really stupid as a, as a young Christian, for about a week or two, if I felt guilty and kind of beat myself up and just tried really hard to, to live the right way, I'd start to feel like, okay, now, now I can come back into God's presence. Now his arms are open again. Now the door of his house is open. But on the cross, when Jesus was dying and paying for our sins and bearing our punishment and bearing our shame and taking it all upon himself, the Bible says the temple and the curtain, I, I, the, the curtain and the temple was torn apart from top to bottom, the Bible says. Look it up. Torn the, and and so, so in the temple, there was the court of the Gentiles, the court of the women, the courtyard of the priests, and only certain people could come there. And then there was the temple proper. Then there was the holy place. Then there was a curtain. And then there was the most holy place. And the most holy place was the dwelling place of God. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And they believed that the very presence of God sat over the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant, and that was God's glory and presence right there. And there were all these dividers. The Gentiles could come so, so far. The women could come so far. The priests could come so far. And only the high priest, only once a year, only the high priest once a year could come into the most holy place and bring an offering. And they literally tied a rope around the high priest's ankle and put bells on the high priest so if they stopped, if they didn't hear the bells jingling, and they think the high priest passed out. Nobody could go help me. You weren't allowed in there. So they would literally take the rope and they would pull the high priest back out. Nobody went in there. Because that was the presence of God. And as Jesus hung on the cross, bearing our sins, the Bible says that that curtain between the holy place and the most holy place was torn in two from top to bottom. That's God's way of saying, come on over. There's food on the table. There's a hot pot of coffee. Jacob, come to my home, draw near me. And so Jacob says, this is Bethel. This is the house of God. And I have been in the presence of my God. He is God Almighty, El Shaddai. And his arms and his home and his grace are always open. And if you've come to the cross and received Jesus Christ, 
The curtain has been torn. And you, you know, so, but when I mess up, what's, what's the official length of time I have, to, I have to beat myself up and say I'm unworthy before I step back into the presence of God? Well, we don't, Paul says in Romans 6, we don't sin that grace may abound. We don't take sin lightly. But when we stumble, when we fall, his grace is available now. And every minute we stay out of his presence and out of his house, the enemy has a victory. Jesus says, don't ever leave. Don't ever go away. Come back into my presence. It's us who push ourselves away from God, not God who pushes us away. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, if you're watching this online, or if you're here in the worship center or on campus, and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, when is his grace available to wash you clean of your sins? Right now. The eternal now, right now, always available. His arms are open. And so here's the, the, the other question I want to ask you tonight. Do you hear the invitation of El Shaddai to draw near to him? Because he is closer than you think. Do you hear him saying, draw near, come on in. You're welcome all the time. And I want to just finish with a picture in this time in history when people, I think, are so depleted and discouraged. And we need to be reminded that we are bound to God and his strength. I, I went out into my yard, and we got a tree out in the front of our house that's very, very brittle. And if you said, if this is kind of my life, and you say, well, you know, I'm feeling pretty strong today. There's nothing you could do to me. I'd be like, oh, well, but I'm really, it's like, no, guess what? No matter how strong I think I am, I'm not strong enough to overcome the stuff of this world. But I love this picture. And I, I heard somebody share this years ago. They said, okay, but if this is a picture of God's power and God's, this nail. Reminds of the nail that Jesus took, the, the sacrifice he paid. He said, you know, can I, I'm sure there's super strong people who could bend this nail, but then if they were, that was the case, I would just get them a bigger nail that they couldn't bend, to make the point. You know, he said, okay, I can't bend this. So if I say, if, this, if God's power is greater than mine, and if I bring my life and put it right next to God, and if I, as I seek him, as I seek him in his word, as I pray, as I walk with him, as I worship, as I surrender to him, I just bind myself to him. In the book of, the book of John, it talks about Jesus says, abide in me, let my word abide in you. And so if I stay bound to him, now the world comes, now the enemy comes and tries to bend and break me. But the problem is I'm bound to the one who is powerful, who is glorious, who can't be bent. Have I become any stronger in who I am at this moment than I would? No, I'm no stronger. But I'm bound to the one who is El Shaddai. Amen? So God, this is our prayer. As we get ready to come to the table, as we prepare to partake of these elements that remind us that the unbreakable God of the universe chose to come to this world, take on flesh, and be broken for us so that by your wounds we could be healed. In your weakness we could be strong. We pray in the bread. We will see the body of Jesus offered for us. We pray in the cup. We will see the final once for all sacrifice. The blood of Jesus which washes away our sins. We pray that as we come to the table this evening, whether we're at home alone or at home with family or here on campus. We pray that we will encounter you, God Almighty. And that in some mysterious way, we'll be reminded tonight that as we partake of the bread, as we partake of the cup, this is just one more way that we bind ourselves to you so that your power makes us strong. So Lord, meet us in this time together. If you're at home or online, hopefully you've already gathered items for communion, but if you haven't, get something to drink and a cracker, or some bread, something. A drink and some bread. If you're here in the worship center on our campus, you should have gotten a little one of these communion kits there. If you didn't, would you raise your hand and we have folks ready uh, just to bring one right over to you. And if you'll just peel that little top layer. So raise your hand if you didn't get one. Then our team's right here are kind of looking for you and they'll bring them right over to you. Okay, right up here in the front. Right up here. There you go. And if you have that little kind of communion kit, just peel that little top little layer off and take the wafer, a reminder of the body of Christ. Now, it's, it's just bread. It's just a wafer, but it reminds us of what he did. So kind of hold that in one hand. And then peel the other, the other piece off so you have the cup ready. Don't squeeze it too hard. It's kind of, you know, just don't squeeze it. It'll explode. But just kind of peel that one off and hold the, the wafer in one hand and the cup in the other. And as you do, listen to these words spoken through the prophet Isaiah long before Jesus came as Messiah. These prophetic words pointing to the one who would come. 
And Isaiah, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, wrote these words. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Prophesying of the Lamb of God of Jesus, he wrote, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, every one of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have wandered. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In Luke 22, we get Jesus reclining at the table with his disciples. And he begins to tell them what the bread represents and what the cup represents. Listen to what God's word has to say. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and he broke it. And gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. As you hold the elements in your hands, I want you to imagine a friend of yours who doesn't know Jesus asking you, why do you do this? Why do you do that communion thing? I hope you would tell them because in communion I remember like Jesus told me to that his body was broken to make me whole. In communion, I remember his blood was shed to wash me clean. I hope you would tell them because in communion, I join my heart with the family of God. Right now, we're scattered around this room, around our campus, and around this community, probably around the world with Shoreline. But we are one. You could tell your spiritually curious friend when we take communion, we stand with the body of Christ around the world throughout time, remembering the one who gave his life for us. And I hope you would tell them, because at the table, when I hold the bread and partake of it, when I hold the cup and partake of it, I experience grace, undeserved, unearned love poured out from heaven. And the bread and the cup I remember that God has lavished forgiveness and love and blessing on me. So that's what I'm doing when I take communion. That's what we're doing tonight. So as you prepare to partake of the elements, as we lead you through this time, remember Jesus. Remember what he's done and the price he's paid. Experience community. That we're not, and even if you're at home alone, you're not alone. We're in this family together. And say, God, fill me with your grace. Fill me with your power that I might live for you. As we come to the table, I want to encourage you just to take that wafer and just hold it in your hand. And just for a moment, just pause and reflect on what Jesus did for me and for you. That we get to come here, we get to examine our heart, and we get to give thanks that Jesus went to the cross for me and for you to take all of our iniquities, all of our sin on the cross. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body that is broken for you. He has such great love for us that he was gonna go be our sacrifice on the cross. It is...
gift that we don't deserve. And every time I hold this, I go, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your broken body that went to the cross to set me free. Eat this in remembrance of me. same way at that table Jesus took the cup and he asked them to partake of it in remembrance of him this cup which we bless is our communion with the shed blood of Jesus Christ it reminds us that he held nothing back it reminds us that the almighty God came among us as one of us to bring us home to him As you partake of this cup, remember his grace, his love, and his power unleashed through his sacrifice and resurrection. Let's partake of the cup together. Heavenly Father, it is so good to be here tonight. It is so good to be here in this moment, reflecting on what your son Jesus Christ did for each and every one of us so that we could have life, have new life in him. It is something that we didn't deserve, but he willingly went to the cross to take all of our sin, all of our shame. Yes. We don't deserve that. But man, Jesus, we are grateful. And God, I pray as we get to continue to worship you, God, this would be the cry of our heart here at Shoreline Church, online, wherever you may be, that this is what is deep down. It is our love for you just coming from our lips. So God, fill this place. We absolutely love you. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In your name we pray.